Good morning, and welcome to our celebration of praise and worship brought to you by Wesley Freedom United Methodist Church. It's our prayer that wherever you are joining us from, today's worship helps you grow closer to God and deepen your walk of discipleship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to be remembering and giving thanks for the way that Christ gave us living water through the sacrament of baptism. And later in the service, we are going to be engaging in a ritual celebration, a remembrance of our baptisms. So before we get started, if you can go to your kitchen or bathroom and get a glass or a bowl of water later in the service, we will use that together to remember and celebrate our incorporation into Christ in this holy sacrament. I invite you to enter into an attitude now of prayer and of worship. Let us come before the Lord. Almighty God, whose mercy is over all your works, we praise you for the blessings that have been brought to mankind through your holy church throughout the world. We bless you for the grace of your sacraments, for the fellowship in Christ with you and with one another, for the teaching of the scriptures and for the preaching of your word. We thank you for the holy example of your saints in all the ages, for your servants departed this life in your faith and your fear, and for the memory and example of all that has been true and good in their lives. We humbly ask you today that we may be numbered with them in the great company of the redeemed in heaven. Lord, today we come to you in praise and in prayer. We come to you specifically in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who while he was on earth taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My name is Gary Wyndham. Today, our scripture lesson comes from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sitcher, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The great preacher Spurgeon once said, the Word of God is like an ever-flowing fountain. The more you draw from it, the more you may draw. Will you pray with me and for me? God of wisdom, grace, and truth, you are an endless well. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us who reflect upon your Word. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and minds to understand your endless grace for us and your endless desire to refresh all of your people. Amen. As you settle into this message this morning, I have a challenging question for you. Are you a cup of cold water, or are you a bitter pill? When those around you are hurting, or vulnerable, or seeking, do they come towards you to be refreshed, or do they avoid you? out of fear of judgment or harshness. Today's scripture encounter begins with Jesus surrounded by the Pharisees. They are once again having a tired debate about who is baptizing more people. They're concerned with the statistics and who's greater than the other. Jesus is exasperated by their pointless rhetoric and he walks away from them. 
These religious folks should be Jesus' people, but he leaves them in order to walk through Samaria. It is after a few hours of walking that Jesus has grown tired and weary from his travels, and so he stops at a well for refreshment. A woman arrives at the well in the heat of the noontime hour, and Jesus asks her, Will you give me a drink of water? The request seems simple enough to us. She is having a bucket, and he is thirsty. The woman, though, is shocked and put back. You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How do you ask me for a drink? The author of the gospel reminds us what we need to know here by whispering, so Jews don't associate with Samaritans. The truth is that while going through Samaria was the shortest road to his destination, No Jew other than Jesus would have cut through that way. Samaritans were untouchable. By Jewish tradition, if Jesus had drank from her cup, he would have become unclean, perhaps even not available to go teach at the synagogue or be in the temple. Jews and Samaritans had a long history and continue to have deep, hurtful divides and disagreements. The woman points out to Jesus that she is not only from the wrong tribe, but she is also a woman. This might cause those with knowledge of the Torah to lean in and listen a bit more closely. Typically in the scriptures, when a man meets a woman at the well, there's a lifelong romance brewing. Encounters at the well had a tendency to stick. The Samaritan woman knows her past, though. She knows she is not available. She was there in the heat of the day, likely because her painful and sordid history with romance has caused her to be broken, isolated, and fearful of judgment. While she is stepping away from Jesus, accounting all the reasons why they can't share a glass of water, Jesus is leaning towards her. While she sees all the lines, race, religion, history, gender, lifestyle, drawn between the two of them, Jesus is reaching out his hand and asking to share water. If you knew, Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God that is with you, you would ask for a drink and he would give you living water. If you knew, Jesus said, if you knew the unconditional love that God has for you, if you knew God's endless grace that is available, if you knew who I was standing here, you would have asked and received life-giving water. But she does not yet know. What he offers seems unpractical and impossible. The well is deep, and he does not have a bucket. Are you greater than Jacob who dug this well? Who do you think you are? She is questioning. Jesus is patient. Jesus explains the gift that he offers. It is not a drink to wet the tongue. Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again, he says. But whoever drinks the water that I give, they will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them, Jesus promises, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is not offering water to hydrate the body, but to refresh the soul. The water he is extended is offered as an outward sign, a means of grace, which can communicate God's invisible, transformative blessings. She thought she came to that well to fill a jug, to care for herself and her family. He came to meet her there, to satisfy the needs of a lifetime, to extend to her a new relationship which would bubble up into eternal life. This woman, who had been dehydrated by her own mistakes, 
who had been set aside likely by her community because of her shameful lifestyle, here is invited to be refreshed by the grace which Jesus offers. She is invited to be washed with the forgiveness that he would give readily. And she is invited to begin a new relationship, an eternal, life-giving relationship with God through Jesus. This week, our Wesley Freedom community will celebrate baptism for the first time in four months. Having been a part in order to spread the, the spread to slow the spread of disease, we now will begin to gather again outside, which affords us the ability to baptize our children. At our outdoor services this Sunday, we will pour out water and invite two families to bring their sons to be bathed in the love of God. In a few moments, those of you watching here online will also have the opportunity to remember the power of baptismal water. The water of our baptism reminds us, becomes for us that outward sign that we can see and hear and touch, that brings to our awareness the grace of God ever flowing towards us. Like a drenching summer rain, the water is available to us all. The rain does not stop at the state border, Rain does not discriminate between rich and poor. As Jesus says, it rains on the good and the evil alike. Rain doesn't know black or brown or red and white. The rain falls and seeks to cut through the hard earth and press its way into every nook and cranny to rehydrate and refresh all of creation. Likewise, Without us even asking, without anyone being excluded, God's prevenient grace falls on all of us like a summer rain and invites the fullness of our lives to be softened, washed clean, revived, and claimed. As a farm kid, I can remember the excitement of a long-awaited summer rain. Perhaps in your youth, you had the opportunity to dance in the rain a time or two. When the drops started falling, our family would go out on the porch and watch the water fall. We would see with wonder how shriveled corn stalks would open up and absorb the saving moisture. Often we would lose ourselves in excitement, run off the porch to be drenched. We would laugh and dance as the water ran down our cheeks, through our belly buttons, all the way to moisten our shoes. Jesus invites the woman at the well to understand that his grace is bottomless, a ceaseless rain available to her and all of us. He invites her to step off the porch of her hesitation, to step beyond her religious quandaries, to move beyond cultural divides and even her own guilt and shame in order to be washed in the living water Jesus alone could give. She responds wisely, give me this water. With that invitation, with that opening of her soul, she receives the living water that he promises will bubble up for relationship with God in the moment, endure death, and carry her into life everlasting. That water transforms her identity. She indeed begins in that moment a new relationship, an eternal relationship with the Lord, her God, but also opens her to the continually outpouring of the Holy Spirit, through which she would be transformed day by day. When we are baptized, or when we bring our children to be baptized, we do the same. We say, give me this water. We step off the porch, surrender control, and make ourselves available to the grace of God. We invite God to rain down on us the fullness of his love and grace, through which we are claimed 
for that identity, that relationship as God's beloved children. In our baptism, we celebrate God's wisdom, God's power, God's willingness to wash us clean. We acknowledge that like the woman at the well, we have acted selfishly. We have injured others with our words or our actions. We have failed to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. As we come to be washed, we confess our sins and our need for divine redemption. We're little ones, like the boys we will baptize on Sunday, Bennett and Noah. We claim their innocence. We know that aside from a few headbutts or stubborn grunts, they are innocent children. But yet we know that they are born in a world full of temptation. And so we ask God to pour out God's grace even on our babies, that as they grow, as they are challenged, and yes, as they step at times away from God's intentions, that they can call upon that cistern of grace and forgiveness and be washed perpetually in the forgiveness of their Savior. In our baptism, we are claimed. We are washed, and we invite the Holy Spirit to rain down on us. Not just a little, not just a Dixie cup full, but a downpour of transforming spirit. It takes more. It takes more than one good rain for a seed to sprout, to grow a stalk, for ears to come on a piece of corn. It requires seasons of rain, a high water table for good fruit and produce to be produced. We need God's perpetual outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the steady rain season after season, in order for us to be transformed from the selfish creatures that we can so easily become into the persons which reflect God's love and grace for the world. Do you remember my opening question? What do you think? Are you a bitter pill these days? Are you sulking on the porch because rain is not what you ask for? Are you overwhelmed with guilt or shame or feeling unworthy? Are you lonely and wondering while you, why you are at the well alone? If you're a bitter pill, get off the porch. See Jesus sitting at the well of your experience and inviting you to get wet. Invite Jesus to pour his love, his grace, and his forgiveness into you so that you can be refreshed and become refreshing. Step out into the rain. Welcome God to pour God's blessing into your life. And as you stand there getting soaked, enjoying God's company, being filled up with God's blessing, being washed and restored, would you lift up a glass? Invite God to refresh you, heal you, set you free, and fill you to such an extent that you'll not only be revived, but you will be so full of grace that you can become a glass of cold water. After her encounter with Jesus, the Samaritan woman went running from the well. She went running towards the very people who had likely pushed her aside. She went running to share grace with the community who likely did not have much grace for her. She went running to tell Samaritans about this Jew who had offered her living water. She did not go towards them in bitterness, saying, See, Jesus loved me. No, she went with them with this refreshing heart, overflowing with the water that bubbles up to life. There are so many who are dehydrated in your family, in our community, in our church. There are school board members who haven't heard a word of reassurance in months, 
There are government leaders who have heard so many complaints that they are beat down. There are teachers and parents who are afraid of what September will bring. There are small business owners dehydrated, hourly workers exasperated, doctors and nurses tired. We are all worn out in unique ways because everything right now is just a little harder and much of the sweetness has been withdrawn. It is understandable that we would become bitter pills, that we would become impermeable ground, unable to listen, to receive, to be graceful with each other. But we don't have to be. For those of us who have heard the good news of Jesus Christ, for those of us who know who Jesus is, for those of us who have received the outpouring of divine love and kindness and grace and goodness, we can overflow. We can have enough to share that we can be refreshing. Friends, we invite you this morning to come and remember your baptism. And if you have not yet been baptized, then consider today, if baptism is a means of grace, that you would long to have God pour into your life. As you hear this reaffirmation, those who have been baptized throw the water on you, the water from your glass, place it on your head in the shape of a cross. Remember the identity you have in Jesus. And those not yet baptized, consider if you would like to be washed, that you can wear the sign of Jesus. If you do long to be baptized, call or email the church. Pastor Ian or I or a preacher at the church next door to you would be delighted to refresh you through baptism. And after we share in this celebration, after we are washed, revived, and refreshed, we will go from this place empowered to be God's refreshing people, encouragers, listeners, grace givers, a glass of cold water for a dehydrated people. God bless you. Promised good 
I'll soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever. We now welcome you to take that glass of water from your home to reflect upon how refreshing it is to you. And we invite all who have been baptized to remember your baptism. And if you have not yet been baptized, as you listen to this liturgy, consider if you would like to receive the gift of baptism. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift, and it is offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism. We acknowledge all that God is doing for us, and we affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. As these vows were made, at your baptism, we make them again and renew them today. On behalf of the whole church, I ask of you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to persons of all ages, nations, and races? I do. According to the grace given to you, will all of you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? I will. Now we remember the creed of the church, and we claim our faith as Christians. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead and on the third day rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Let us pray. God, as we see this water poured out, we remember the ebb and flow of your grace from the dawning of creation. When nothing existed but chaos, you swept across dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. And after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought to the promised land through the Jordan. In the fullness of time, God, you gave us Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. And he called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. God, we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit 
on this gift of water, the water before those who worship with us in their homes. God, so impart your grace upon this water that it will be an outward and visible sign that we can touch and taste and feel, revealing to us the mysteries of your grace. As we reflect upon this water, as we claim it as our own, claim us as your children, wash away our sins, and clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in Christ's final victory. Friends, we invite you to take the water that is with you in your home, or if you don't have any at this moment, go and find some at our closing. Take the water. Experience the refreshment of it. Touch it. Taste it. Feel it on your head. Remember all the ways that God has refreshed and restored you through water. And let this water be evidence of God's willing to claim, forgive, and sanctify you. Let us pray. Almighty God, fill the homes in which those who are listening dwell and fill the water which they hold to so impart your grace that they would discover who you are in their midst. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, as you depart from this holy moment, we pray that you have been refreshed by God's grace. And we pray that you will go into the world to be generous, supporting the church through your offerings, and all the more important, refreshing those around you, especially the Samaritans, the ones that might not be the most obvious neighbors those who most need a word of forgiveness, grace, understanding, encouragement from you. Go in the name of the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.